Good morning. How are you? It's Saturday. It's cold outside. You've traveled. We're very excited that you're here. Um, we have some extraordinary panelists today, and I'm fortunate enough to start this, um, get us talking about the things um, that the cannabis industry, uh, the people involved in that from, from all sides, whether they're patients, whether they're producers, cultivators, ancillary um, providers, we, we, we need to engage each other, and, and we need to look at um, whether or not cannabis can com contribute to the sustainable development goals of 2030. So what we're looking at is a, an 11-year period to persuade the world that cannabis is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and so with that in mind, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Amy King. Uh, I have been a policy, I've been a patient advocate for 20 years and um, got into cannabis because I saw it healing veterans. I saw the impact that it was making on veterans who were willing to take their lives at, at the number of 22 a day. And there was a problem with that. Um, so kind of how I got into this space I'm still a policy patient advocate, and um, I'm here at this international level because outside of the purviews of my American life, I'm a global traveler. I live in Mexico, and I've seen the impact of the drug war. I've seen and know that there are tens of thousands of people in Mexico where I reside who have lost their lives. Um, all told with the people that are missing and unaccounted for, we're well over 100,000 in a decade. And um, the cost of this societally is, is enormous. You can't, even, you can't even put a number on the destruction of families and the loss of life and um, having no control of your community environment like we're seeing right now under prohibitive um, measures to keep this illegal. Um, and so I, I want to I not come into this necessarily controversial, but I want to point out something um, that I think that my component counterparts in FAT um, agree on, and that is that we need to build a future consensus that cannabis plant, um, the only difference between cannabis and hemp has been the artificial creation of prohibitive policies. Um, and that's going to be controversial for those who are working in the hemp space and the market. They want this distinction between marijuana and, and hemp. And we need to stop that right now. Uh, I feel. <laughs> and so the, the goal of this particular panel at this point is going to be um, to reset the debate on the basis of the genus of cannabis sativa, how it has interacted with our human society for, for thousands of years, um, regardless of the psychoactivity of the plant. This plant has, from the very basic needs of humans, can fill that. Food, clothing, and shelter can be made from this plant, regardless of whether it's psychoactive or not. Um, and so it, this, beyond this artificial distinction of a drug type or uh, a fiber seed type, it would be interesting for us to identify you know, how we can bring this back around to it not being necessarily about one of a drug of abuse or one that's going to build our homes and our communities. Um, so with that in mind, our, our sustainable development goals that we think we can tackle and talk about in here today we might be uh, number, the number one sustainable goal is no poverty. And, and we have an opportunity um, to share the wealth that this plant can generate. Um, number two, zero hunger. Wow, it's like a really wide open thing. The number of, of food products that can be created using uh, cannabis sativa are innumerable, and we're seeing some of that explosion on the market now. What else do we have? We have clean water and sanitation, um, affordable and clean energy. 
Oh, what else did we talk about? Sustainable cities and communities, infrastructure. What else? Peace, justice, and strong institutions be another one. So with that in mind, I'd actually like to introduce our first speaker, Tony Silvazio. And he is, let's see. Pull this up. Dr. Silvazio holds a PhD in sociology and he specializes in the areas of survey research methods, environmental sociology, social movements, globalization, green criminology, and community organizing. He is a faculty member in the Department of Sociology and teaches courses in environment and community um, at Humboldt State University. So I believe you, I was looking for your... Uh, great, great. Thank you very much. Good morning. Th good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank everyone here and the organizers of the conference. Would you like me to stand here? No, yo, you're fine. Yeah, I just sure. didn't know if we... He doesn't have PowerPoint. No, no. No PowerPoint. Just words. Just words. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so I want to thank everybody for organizing this amazing conference and for having me participate. Um, Today my goal is to provide you all with uh, the broad outlines of some issues regarding cannabis and the environment in California. And uh, it's going to be a little bit of a downer, some of these uh, topics, um, but I think the California experience is really instructive if we are to achieve these goals that you have pointed out so clearly of sustainability and, um, and, uh, and, and equity. So I want to start out my talk by making two points. Uh, first there's nothing inherently ecological about the cannabis plant. The environmental problems that I'm gonna discuss associated with cannabis are problems of social policy. And I wanna make that very clear from the outset that the ecological impacts that I'm gonna talk about um, are a result of prohibitionist policy regimes that emerged in the early 20th century. The second point that I wanna make is that although a number of states in the, in the US have legalized recreational and medicinal cannabis, uh, it's still an illegal Schedule I narcotic in my country. So though you may hear about legalization here and there, the legal frameworks for prohibition unfortunately remain in the US. And obviously at the federal level and also with UN treaties. Uh, that said, my academic research the last 10 years is focused on understanding the unintended environmental consequences of the war on drugs. Um, and this has been mostly severely felt in the cannabis producing region in Northern California that I call home the Emerald Triangle. Uh, California, we were the first to legalize medical cannabis. Today there are over 50,000 outdoor cannabis farms and, over, and thousands more indoor enterprises. Uh, so for the last 30 plus years, unregulated cannabis agriculture in California has dominated the landscape. Um, it's shifted from a small, ecologically benign cottage industry during the back to the land era with the hippies to today's sort of corporate green rush where it's got extensive environmental impacts. And I'm going to discuss just some of these impacts here. Um, the impacts include habitat loss and fragmentation from illegal logging and clearing of land, illegal water diversions and dewatering of streams, illegal road building, as well as fertilizer, pesticide, fungicide, and fossil fuel runoff into waterways. The extraction of water for cannabis agriculture, and again, we have 50,000 farms um, in California. Um, <clears throat> the extraction of water is, is, in some watersheds has had a lethal effect on federally listed salmon, steelhead trout, salamander populations, virtually dewatering streams and collapsing aquatic ecosystems. The impacts to biodiversity, uh, in addition to those, we have pesticide poisoning of wildlife with rodenticides and illegal wildlife poaching. These things are commonplace on, on, on public lands in the US. And we have pollution and runoff from pesticide use ending up in our creeks, our lakes, and our rivers that supply water for rural and tribal communities. Now these impacts, some of them have been studied by ecologists, but we still don't know the true extent to which they've impacted ecological systems and, and biodiversity. Uh, unregulated cannabis agriculture in Northern California is our primary environmental problem. 
Uh, and that said, uh, enter Proposition 64, uh, the promise of legalization. The promise of legalization was to deal with these environmental abuses. So in California, in 2016, we passed the pop proposition legalizing recreational cannabis. It was heralded as policymakers, by policymakers as the environmental gold standard of cannabis legislation. And the goals of the measure were to address those environmental issues I described um, related to environmental issues and unregulated cannabis produ production. It also was going to provide funding for conservation, restoration work, and enforcement of environmental laws. And uh, I should say that it's been effective in reining in the most egregious um, uh, cultivators who are causing harm, but with 50,000 farms, it's impossible to, to regulate 50,000 farms that don't want to be regulated. Um, so this, this promise of an ecologically sustainable cannabis industry from Proposition 4, 64, it was complicated by the short-term revenue demands of the state and big corporate cannabis interest. So before the legislation even went into effect, there were important environmental protections that were written into the initiative. Those were overridden by the state. And those protections were limits on the number of licenses and also an acreage cap on cultivation. So these changes prior to even implementation um, removed protections for small farmers and for our, for our uh, small farmers trying to compete against large industrial players. And they also encouraged cultivators to expand their operations, increasing their demand on scarce resources. In addition, cannabis policymakers in California have excluded meaningful civil society participation on cannabis boards and advisory committees instead opting for big cannabis interest to dominate the policy process. So the industrial cannabis um, lobby spent more than a million dollars lobbying policymakers, and it is using its financial resources and political capital to push for regulations that limit their profitability and impair for us ecosystems. So agency capture is unfortunately happening already in California. That said, the first six months of, legi of a legalization, um, we've struggled really to rein in the unregulated market and bring growers into a regulatory environment. Um, we don't really have a lot of accurate data on compliance, but industry estimates that of the 50,000 cannabis cultivators in California, only less than 10% less than have made it to the regulated market. So that's uh, about half driven back into the unregulated market. And the question is why? And I want to talk just briefly about some of the barriers to the regulated market that exist as it sits with California today. Um, small scale cultivators that are practicing ecological um, sustainability they point to the complexity of the new rules that are created and the cost of state licensing and compliance fees as substantial barriers. So what that does is leave only those with the financial resources access to the regulated market. Um, the state has issued approximately around 5,000 permits for growing cannabis, um, with a majority of those now own multiple licenses. So we have a little more than 2,000 um, companies that have permits, if you will. Another problem identified as a barrier to entry by small-scale cultivators is this regressive tax. So we have a regressive tax on cultivation. And in most jurisdictions, cultivators, regardless of size, have high excise taxes, you have a state cultivation tax, and you have municipal taxes. Uh, in my county, and this is going to be absurd to those that are farmers, we have uh, a, a square footage tax on cultivation before you harvest. So you're, you're charged a tax before you even harvest your crop. Um, so these are really important barriers that need to be addressed. It's not only an economic burden for small family farmers, but these, these taxes are anti-ecological. And they encourage growers to expand their operations and change their cultivation methods to achieve more harvest through outdoor, indoor, mixed light, increasing demands on water, forests, and the elect and electric grid. So the current tax model we have in California incentivizes large-scale cultivation and discourages sustainable practices. Um, 
a couple more I want to hit on before I close. We also have local bans in California. Um, the state sets minimum licensing standards, but local municipalities can opt out. And what we've seen is um, uh, local uh, government agencies being more restrictive. Cannabis businesses are not permitted in 70% of the jurisdictions of California, driving thousands of cultivators back into the unregulated market. And, and that's 70% in the state. That's, that's a huge number. Another piece is energy use in greenhouse gas. Uh, that's one of the most important environmental impacts of the legal cannabis industry, that, that, that the carbon footprint. Um, indoor cannabis agriculture in California prior to legalization has, was, was 3% of the state's electric consumption. That's the equivalent of a million California homes being provided with electricity. So post-legalization, um, still trying to figure the numbers out, but it's certainly going to stay at three and maybe even go higher. Um, the, the problem with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, again, and the licensing of indoor is complicating efforts of those in the state who've developed climate action plans and clean energy goals to reduce carbon emissions. And as the leading supplier of cannabis in the United States, the tax revenues that we generate in California is not really going to reflect the true climate costs of the carbon footprint of our industry. Uh, the final sort of piece I want to talk about is the packaging. Um, along with the old environmental problems of prohibition, we have uh, a new kind of, of pollution from uh, uh, liberalization in the form of packaging, the bulk of which is not recycled. While the environmental impact of these packaging requirements won't be known for some time, it's thought to be substantial, uh, the impact. Um, we're looking at non-recyclable waste from vape pens uh, and oil cartridges likely to result in more waste in California landfills. Um, it's predicted that the cannabis industry will produce over one million units of single plastic packaging waste per year in California. So in conclusion, the environmental impacts of prohibition of post-prohibition cannabis policy. They will not be clear for several years, but what I've described here are significant, significant policy challenges that we're going to need to address to really effectively mitigate and reduce these environmental harms associated with cannabis legalization. Um, as with any ag, ag activity, cannabis requires land and other inputs. Um, it's not going to have a zero environmental impact, but we can craft policy that, impact, that minimizes the impact and promotes environmental sustainability. And I think this conference provides us with us a great opportunity to develop solutions to these problems, and, and I look forward to having these conversations. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It's, it's so interesting to really talk about and acknowledge the environmental impacts the, that prohibitive um, laws have, have caused the environment. Because cannabis plant is a, a carbon sequester. I mean, it's good for our environment. And here we are, we find ourselves in this place where um, cannabis is actually causing more damage then it's um, returning back to us at this time. And so again, I'm not trying to pick on our big corporate um, entities, but we're actually saying to you at this time that you have to also assume some responsibility. We need to see some energy inputs and outputs, and we need to make sure that, that the products that we're putting out there are not a contributor to the degradation of our society, that they're more of a contributor to a positive and that you're conscious about this plant that's been used for thousands of years. And it's not just a money opportunity, it's an opportunity for us to better our planet um, and use it appropriately and consciously aware of this obligation um, is where we need to see our large cannabis partners and, and, and manufacturers. So I'm going to continue to hold us up to that standard. I hope that you'll join in with us um, in, in making these commitments. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Ryan Stoa. He is an associate professor at Concordia University of Law in Boise, Idaho, where he teaches property law, administrative law, environmental law, and natural resources law. Um, 
He is the author of Craft Weed, Family Farming, and the Future of the Marijuana Industry. And um, today he's going to talk about the, the pathways for a future of cannabis markets post-legalization and merging, uh, and how cannabis farming and production can be sustainable, local, and even artisanal. Thank you very much, Amy, and uh, thank you to the organizers of the conference for having me here today. Uh, as Amy mentioned, I'm a law professor in the U.S. state of Idaho. Uh, for those of you that are familiar, Idaho is one of the least progressive states in the United States when it comes to uh, cannabis policy. I think we're, we're one of three states in the country that have maintained a complete prohibition, so we have not legalized any type of Charlotte's Web law or CBD oil or decriminalized possession in any way, despite uh, being completely surrounded by U.S. states or Canada that have at least legalized uh, medicinal or recreational use. Uh, so many times when I'm speaking uh, about this topic back at home, I'm getting blank stares uh, or fear and people looking at me like, why are you talking about this? Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, thinking about some of these issues that, that I've been thinking about um, for the past several years. I originally came to this topic um, uh, several years ago uh, as I was uh, studying water rights and water conflicts around the world and uh, especially uh, in the United States. Uh, and it came to my attention that there were some really interesting water conflicts being presented uh, by cannabis agriculture, uh, especially in Northern California. As Tony mentioned uh, there were water withdrawals being made across Northern California in the uh, Emerald Triangle of Trinity, Mendocino, and Humboldt counties. Uh, and many of these water withdrawals uh, were illegal. Uh, on the other hand, many of the farmers I started speaking with uh, noted that there wasn't a mechanism for them to be making legal water withdrawals. And so it prevented somewhat of a conflict or, or some tension, a challenge for the state, uh, if you will, on how to usher in, uh, as Tony mentioned, 50,000 marijuana farms uh, into the legal marketplace uh, in a way that gave them sufficient water rights to exist, on the one hand, without disrupting the existing water rights users uh, on the other hand. I also should mention um, that another reason I became interested in, in this topic is a personal connection. A very good friend of mine uh, acquired a marijuana farm in Humboldt County, California, uh, which also included a, a few acres of vineyards. So he's now making wine and making weed. Uh, and through this experience helped uh, educate me on some of the particulars and personal experiences of what it's like uh, to be a marijuana farmer uh, in California and the United States today. And in my discussions with farmers and regulators over the last several years, it seems one uh, major question or, or source of conflict um, in the industry is sort of what the future vision or what the future framework of marijuana farming will be. Uh, will it be, on the one hand, uh, sort of dominated by big marijuana, or a few very large 10,000 acre farms uh, that flood the market with very cheap generic forms of marijuana flower? Or on the other hand, will it continue to be dominated uh, as it has in the past by small scale family farmers producing unique strains uh, and higher quality products? Uh, there is at the moment uh, not a clear resolution to this topic. Uh, as Tony's presentation articulated, you sort of had in 2016 in California uh, a legal framework that would appear to protect the small-scale farmer uh, by limiting the size or acre by placing acreage limits on farm licenses. On the other hand, it would appear that the state uh, is scaling back uh, on that requirement and now moving forward with potential licensing scheme that would not place acreage limits on farms. Uh, and so. One of the attempts of my research, including my uh, book, and apologies here for the shameless self-promotion, uh, it's called Craft Weed, Family Farming, and the Future of the Marijuana Industry. Uh, I attempt to, to answer the question, uh, can small-scale, artisanal, sustainable family farming methods still exist in the legal marijuana industry, uh, perhaps alongside a big marijuana framework, much like 
Uh, you have your craft beers coexisting alongside your Bud Lights. And if so, how? And I'll try to sketch out uh, a few thoughts uh, on that um, here today. The question being, where do we go from here? Um, I argue that uh, governments and consumers and the legal markets have a large role to play in keeping marijuana farming small and sustainable if that is the desire of governments and consumers. The first way that governments might think about this is in the structure of their regulations. In California, for example, over the last few years, there had been a limit on the canopy size of licensed farms. In other words, you could have a farming license, but the maximum size of your farm would be one or two acres. Uh, that is one way in which governments can help keep marijuana farming diversified and relatively small scale in nature. The opposite approach that we've seen in a few states in the United States, uh, including states like Florida and New York, uh, is to limit agricultural licenses to a very small number of state-selected producers. So in the state of Florida, for example, they limited licenses to a total of six producers statewide. For one of our largest states, that obviously creates uh, quite the monopoly on the market for those lucky six chosen uh, companies that get to supply the market uh, with marijuana exclusively. Um, there are some advantages to that latter model for regulators, of course. Uh, it's easier to keep your eye on six producers as opposed to 50,000. Um, you can develop relationships with those producers uh, and ensure that they um, carry out agricultural methods that the state finds to be a priority. Much harder, obviously, to work with 50,000 or more small-scale farms. On the other hand, the disadvantage here is that you're sort of baking in a big marijuana model. You're not allowing marijuana legalization to create a participatory process. So the governor-elect of California, Gavin Newsom, said a few years ago, we don't want to replace one cartel with another. Uh, meaning that if marijuana legalization, which remains relatively <coughs> controversial, uh, is going to move forward, let's at least spread the benefits around and let as many people as the market can reasonably accommodate participate in that market. The second area to consider are marijuana genetics. Uh, there are, of course, hundreds of different strains. We talk about cannabis or marijuana as if it's uh, one product uh, or one end uh, uh, consumption outcome, but really there are hundreds of different strains, as, as most of you uh, probably know. And as we move towards legalization, there will be some very interesting uh, legal issues presented in the area of inter intellectual property. Uh, how will these various strains uh, be patented or trademarked? Um, of course, the, the U.S. government and the federal government, U.S. Patent and Trade Office, uh, historically not been very favorable to uh, patents on psychoactive cannabis strains. Um, that is starting to soften a bit. And as it has, um, there's been some discussion of whether or not this helps or hurts uh, the small-scale uh, family farmer. On the one hand, the uh, diversity of the, the cannabis plant and the amount of uh, the strains that it can support, uh, supports the idea that breeders and small-scale farmers might develop their own unique strains and their own unique trademarks. On the other hand, it has also stoked fears among some in the industry that the sort of big marijuana model will encourage a few uh, corporate entities to gobble up all the patents uh, and dominate uh, the space. Thank you. Uh, much in the same way that some uh, agricultural giants in the United States have uh, used patent law to their advantage. I want to close uh, by encouraging you to consider uh, an organizational framework for marijuana farming that's gaining increasing traction, and that's the idea of a marijuana appellation. Uh, an appellation system uses certified designations of origin to help protect farming regions and farmers and help diversify the market. So you're probably familiar with an Appalachian system in the context of the wine industry. If you have a bottle of wine that says it comes from Bordeaux, 
Uh, you can be reasonably confident that it actually did come from Bordeaux. The grapes were grown there uh, and production took place there. In the case of the French system, uh, we also know that it includes some type of uh, production standards or methods uh, that are enforced in those appellations. The United States also has an appellation system for wine. If you have a bottle of wine that says it comes from Napa Valley, you know it was, comes from grapes that were grown in Napa Valley. There is some reason to believe and there's evidence that an appellation system would be advantageous in the cannabis industry as well. Uh, it would help protect diversified farming regions across the country and across the world. Uh, it would help diversify products. So now you couldn't have one farm produce uh, you know, tons of cheap generic marijuana and flood the marketplace because that's not the only product on the market. There are instead hundreds of different products coming from hundreds of different uh, farming regions. And for the consumer as well, uh, you now have uh, more information about where your product com comes from, perhaps sustainab sustainability standards are attached to that, um, and you have more choice, more options um, on the marketplace. Uh, there's already some movement in Northern California and Mendocino County. They've developed a map of appellations and sub-appellations uh, to try to move forward with this idea, and it's one potential regulatory model to help ensure that family farming and sustainable farming continues to exist in the marijuana industry. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention. Thank you again. Super interesting considerations for us as we move forward in this space. Um, I think that we have to reflect on the very first um, sustainable development goal, no, uh, no poverty. And if you know, we have a majority of conglomerate um, cannabis suppliers, how is that how is that shared to meet sustainable development goal number one? Can corporate cannabis off and inspire small craft allowance um, to, to keep the, to, to redistribute uh, among us the, uh, the allowance to cultivate this wonderful plant that gives us so many diverse um, types of or cultivars. So uh, next I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Boaz Wachtel. I, I'm sorry, MD. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> he has an MBA. I'm sorry. I, 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 I'll take us back. Let, let me start with these accolades. He is an Israeli medical cannabis pioneer and activist um, who formulated and assisted the Ministry of Health. I mean, we look to Israel as a leader in, in this. Um, with the implementation of their national can medical cannabis program. He's the co-founder of Cresso Pharma Limited, and he's the co-founder of MMJ Phytotech and the International Medical Cannabis Patient Coalition, IMPC. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. You're going to... Uh, this... Uh... Do you know where my presentation is, by the way? Uh, I this? do. I was just getting ready to say um, he's going to open with a multidisciplinary uh, experience of merging medical cannabis cultivation with sustainable agricultural management, what, what? Um, in particular uh, difficult or disadvantaged regions. So while, while uh, Hanka is looking for the presentation, um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have many friends here. Uh, activist friends uh, among uh, the FAT uh, uh, organization and some other uh, uh, organizations who helped uh, organize this uh, conference. And... Uh, Do you have a, This is... This was Tony's, right? This was mine. This one. Uh, I've been involved with the medicalization of cannabis in Israel from the onset. Uh, working uh, with the government to formulate a uh, policy and a framework for to medicalize cannabis in Israel. Uh, it's been 20 odd years in the making, and uh, today Israel is uh, one of uh, maybe the three most advanced countries in terms of medical cannabis uh, uh, national medical cannabis programs, which are the Netherlands and uh, Canada and Israel. Okay. Uh, 
which allows you under UN drug conventions to medicalize cannabis uh, and uh, and so forth. <laughs> Thank you, Anka. And uh, I was asked to talk about uh, about uh, the environmental issues uh, related to hemp and. Uh, we, the activists, or those involved in this field of cannabis and hemp, and uh, knows the basic terms, so I just want to run quickly on the basic terms. How many people, by the way, are here from uh, the United Nations that uh, arrived for this conference? You're not the United Nations. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so the, we, we don't have any guests from the United Nations. Okay. You just asked and no one raised their hand, then um, you're okay. as shocked as you, I'm surprised as you. Okay, so uh, I just want to apologize first to our next generations, you know, because the, uh, our children and grandchildren and their children will suffer greatly due to our lack of uh, commitments and, uh, and action on environmental issues. So the life as we know it now, it's not what they're going to uh, see in their lifetime when the climate will, uh, uh, will heat up in two or three uh, or four degrees. So what we do now, and we are very late in the game, uh, there's a report now that uh, all the uh, environmental goals that uh, in the Paris Accord are not going to be met, okay, globally. Actually, there's a rise of uh, emissions globally. So what role would hemp, if any, could play uh, to save this poor plant? Uh, planet that we uh, abuse so uh, greatly. So uh, the cannabis, uh, uh, hemp and cannabis are basically the same plant, which is cannabis sativa. It's been used uh, for 12,000 years. I mean, that's more than most uh, plants, and it's mostly used for seed and oil and the fiber and uh, metabolites. What you see, so the question is, uh, can we do environmental healing with cannabis and can we fight the global warming? Uh, these are pictures uh, of, of, the, uh, of the cannabis, some, uh, some hemp fields. So uh, what's the difference between hemp and marijuana? It's actually one product that will uh, not be produced from industrial, one product that is not produced from uh, industrial hemp is marijuana. Uh, industrial hemp is cross-pollinated with marijuana, greatly lowering drug content of the marijuana. Hemp is usually classified as below 0.3% THC. THC is the enemy of the United Nations. Uh, anything above 0.3 uh, is considered marijuana by uh, the many countries. Okay, this is an artificial distinction emerging from the era, era of prohibition, uh, which basically... Uh, in spite of the prohibition, there are now maybe 30 countries that are growing hemp, okay? But uh, we'll, we'll get to there. Uh, marijuana has higher THC above the 0.3%. And uh, usually it's a plant that is a very sturdy plant. It doesn't need pesticides or herbicides and so forth. It's, uh, it, so the number of uses that uh, it has is really incredible. I don't know of any other plant that has both medicinal uses and industrial uses and building material and food and paper and uh, textiles and, uh, uh, and uh, energy. I mean, it's really amazing. It grows very quickly, yes? And uh, it could, for example, substitute, substitute uh, uh, you know, cutting uh, rainforest for, uh, for, uh, for paper. So hemp is, uh, is the same as cannabis sativa, is the same as marijuana, 0.3%. Uh, you can do many, many things, among them auto parts, soap, con concrete. Uh, the market is about half a billion dollars now annually, whereas in the marijuana, which is the medical and today the recreational that has been legalized in a couple of countries, in Uruguay and Canada, is a big market. The medical and the recreational is a huge market. So it's a wonderful food uh, plant. Uh, uh, you can make uh, hemp seed oil, yes, it's the most balanced uh, 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 oil. It's more balanced and it's more nutritious uh, than, uh, than oil, uh, fish oil that uh, as a kid I suffered, uh, you know, taking uh, fish oil to get stronger when I was young. So this can substitute fish oil, for example. Uh, it has all the omega and so forth, very balanced. Uh, 
It has a wonderful nutritional composition, yes, proteins, 21 known, uh, uh, known uh, amino acids, eight essential ones uh, uh, that, the, uh, that the adult bodies cannot uh, produce, proteins, it can supply a diet, full diet for vegetarians, yes. It's gluten-free, yes, and inherited, in, in, inherently gluten-free and la lactose-free. It's a source of many essential vitamins and minerals. And by the way, there's a, uh, in that context, uh, there's a uh, village in China, in northern China somewhere, where the average age is like 100 years old or something, and they went to check why they live so long, you know, not because of the good air in China. Uh, and they found out the, the village, everybody, they had, uh, they grew hemp and they made hemp uh, milk with the seeds and oil and so forth. And all the food that they cooked went through this uh, uh, hemp milk and, and oil mixed together and it kept them uh, very well. So hemp and cannabis eventually, as I see it, will be used to prevent diseases. Yes, right now it's used as a symptomatic, uh, for symptomatic treatments, but uh, the corporation, uh, sorry, I, I'm an activist who made a switch uh, to, uh, to, in the industry of the cannabis, the global industry, because we activists who suffered, you know, great poverty and, uh, and hardship and harassment from the police, suddenly we saw the emergence of an industry around us, and uh, some of us who were lucky, to participate in this, you know, that's nice. And our goal is also to help those who are, are not able to participate in this industry. And there are a lot of people who are coming now from real estate or from other uh, bankers and uh, investors and so forth. They want to grab a chunk of this uh, industry, you know, the great green uh, rush again. And the activists uh, who, uh, 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 you know, sacrifice their lives uh, often, you know, uh, in pursuit of uh, justice, uh, environmental causes and uh, cannabis legalization, were left behind. So there's a social responsibility that needs to be uh, taken uh, uh, into account uh, in, in, in this uh, industry to help uh, these organizations like FAT and, and other organizations uh, uh, to uh, do their policy and advocacy work. So it's, uh, it's very beneficial as hemp seeds. Uh, it, uh, in terms of paper, uh, you can, uh, one acre of hemp can produce as much paper as four to 10 acres of trees, yes, over 20 years. Uh, it grows in four months, whereas trees grows in, uh, you know, it takes 10 to 80 years. Yeah, it has many benefits, so it's been used. The American Constitution is written on a hemp paper, uh, uh, can canvas, you know, for painters. The Mona Lisa is on canvas. Uh, so it's a great textile as well. So uh, can we heal with, uh, with, uh, the, with hemp or with, uh, with cannabis or with cannabis sativa? Sure we can. They planted in uh, 1998 uh, next to the industrial uh, disaster area in Chernobyl. And one of the scientists uh, checked whether hemp could be used to clean the soil from radioactivity and some other. Uh, uh, and he, he said that hemp is providing to be one of the best phytoremediative plants that we have been able to find. Uh, for the specific contaminants that uh, we tested, hemp demonstrated a very good phytomeridiation a profile. Hemp can be used also as fuel. Five minutes, thank you. Hemp can be used as fuel, okay? Uh, uh, it could provide biodiesel, it could provide ethanol and methanol and so forth. Uh, it's rapidly grown, so uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, it's environmentally, uh, relatively environmentally friendly uh, fuel source. And uh, what else do we have here? Uh, this is the uh, potential, the liters of ethanol per acre from hemp. If you compare uh, the uh, potential of other crops versus hemp to produce, uh, to produce uh, ethanol, uh, you will see that hemp produces any magnitude above anybody else, above maize and sorghum and so forth, uh, as, a bio, as a biofuel source. Uh, this is the environmental effect of uh, hemp versus other crops. And you can see A means that you have little uh, environmental uh, effect and so forth. And then you can look at, the, uh, at other uh, crops uh, which have uh, you know, negative uh, or they have uh, severe environmental uh, uh, effects in the red, like uh, sh <coughs> sugar beet, maize, and potatoes and so forth. So hemp gets uh, green marks for uh, nutrition, uh, nutrient depletion, uh, pesticides, erosion, soil composition, water consumption, biodiversity. So it's 
overall, uh, it's very uh, 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 positive uh, with the environment. So where is the big impact? I mean, it's, uh, if, we substitute, if we substitute cotton, you know, which is the worst crop to be grown, we are all wearing cotton, that they sprayed it uh, uh, with pesticides from the air, from the ground, from the underground, from everywhere, and then we wear it, you know, because it's a very uh, sensitive uh, crop. And uh, in the process of producing this cotton, which is grown in water-poor countries, such as Egypt, you know, which is very water-poor, it's going to get even poorer now because they, uh, they, cut, uh, they, they will cut uh, the water on the Nile and, uh, even more. So if we substitute cotton with, uh, uh, with uh, hemp, with a textile that you can make from hemp, you can do two things. First, you can save these poor countries who uh, grow cotton and destroy their environment and produce uh, uh, and switch them into, uh, uh, yeah, the question is whether they can switch into growing hemp for textile, and the answer is no. They have to get away, we have to move away from growing cotton uh, globally and ha have uh, uh, water-rich countries such as Russia and, and northern countries because uh, hemp is uh, hemp-fed, is uh, rain-fed, then uh, you don't need to irrigate it. So, and you can produce all these textiles, which are much uh, better, they're antibacterial, and they last longer, and uh, you don't have to uh, use all these uh, environmental destructive uh, pesticides and so forth. So we can do that. These are cotton-producing countries. You can see uh, there's a lot of cotton grown around the world. It's a huge industry. It could be substituted. And when you substitute cotton with, uh, with hemp, you reduce water intake, uh, and not depleting aquifers, <clears throat> and you can provide the same, uh, uh, you know, people with, uh, with healthy clothes, not uh, what we wear right now, which is completely uh, chemicalized. Uh, so what else there? We have uh, hemp in water. Uh, it's grown uh, in, in, uh, in, so in Canada, in, in rain-fed rain countries, uh, northern countries. Uh, so it doesn't need irrigation. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, sorry, I don't have much time. Uh, the, world, the world leaders in hemp production are the Chinese. Two minutes, one minute. The Chinese, uh, uh, Canada, uh, the, the Chinese, Russia, and, um, and, uh, and some other, and South Korea. Okay, so uh, hemp is a, just to summarize, Hemp by itself uh, is a wonderful plant to clean the soil, to uh, take less water from, the, from, uh, from water resources, replace, I think, by, by uh, discussing uh, uh, to replace cotton with hemp. That could have a major environmental impact. And this plant now, we have to put it in the context of global warming and climate change and the prohibition that we're trying to abolish would allow the vast uh, uh, spreading of hemp growing and cannabis growing around the world and save uh, 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 many lives uh, with its medical properties and also hopefully uh, contribute to uh, environmental uh, well-being of this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Honka. Uh, or Hana, however you like to call her, uh, Gabrielle Lova, and um, she's a farmer, a, a hemp farmer, and um, I think I'm pretty sure she's been a farmer all of her life, but from her farming, she produces flowers, um, she makes food products, um, she's a colleague of mine here at FAT, and she helped... Um, make sure that everything we're doing here today is seamless. Thank you, Hannah, for that as well. Uh, she imports and exports hemp seeds for sowing. She does research and development of hemp growing and processing. She is an, a, a consultant that is available to your company um, should you need her. And so, Hannah, I'm gonna talk about the, the benefits of food, human and animal, from the non-psychotropic or non-intoxicating consumption. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Anne. She's amazing. I want to be like her when I grow up. <laughs> well, I, I would like to talk in the beginning uh, more about the cannabis history because it wasn't like mentioned much here, and I think it's important to recognize that human being uh, 
like the 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 time where we are today, how we are like well set and like everybody has like at least in Europe like or Western countries enough to eat and to live well, uh, we have thanks to hemp because if this plant will be not last five years or five uh, five thousand years with the human beings, we will never get where we are. Uh, we we was able to educate ourselves thanks to hemp because we was like able to to distribute some information on some uh, cheap material uh, which was like uh, produced into the hemp paper in the China in like more than 2,000 years ago. They developed the the process to oh, 2,000 years before the the crease, so it's like 4,000 years already. They was doing the hemp paper, which was uh, done from the hemp cloth, uh, because uh, before that they was doing the silk paper, which was like very expensive, and they was lo looking for cheap uh, material, and they find out that they can turn like old cloths uh, from hemp fiber into the, the hemp paper, and this was also the technologies which later on was. Um, kind of like move it or like use it also in the like Middle East, later the North, North uh, Africa and later on came to Europe. So in in the 12th century there was like first paper uh, mill and the paper production in the Jativa in the town in south of Spain. And thanks to this, we was able to educate ourselves because we was like able to produce some some uh, some material for uh, cheap prints. So, and you know that like without education we can hardly call ourselves like human beings. So I, I I think like this is like really crucial like things what we have to everybody remember. And also there was. Um, uh, like we will never discover the United States because our ship will never get there without like uh, the the equipment done from hemp, like all the ceilings and like ropes on the boats, which was like um, uh, kind of like well done enough to to maintain such a such a long uh, like uh, um, journeys in this like salty water. And uh, we was always used the hemp textile since the beginning. There are like discoveries from like 10,000 years ago that like human beings was using hemp. I just like went months ago to visit the, the exhibition about the Celts in, in Prague, which is the like a very old tribe in, in Europe. And they was using hemp. They was using hemp flax and, uh, and nettle. So for like fibers, so it's like nothing really new. Yeah, I heard from one Czech uh, parliament member that like why we should like use cannabis. It's like something new. We can like live without that. It's like don't bring something new. It's not new. He said like it has no tradition. It like it's it's not true. Like cannabis has like big tradition with like uh, human society, and we have to everybody. Remember that, and like we was uh, prohibiting cannabis in like 1961, and since that we forgot about everything. Like what, like um, this plan was serving us for thousands of years. I don't really feel that it's correct, and we will never be here without this plan. So please just try to remember that and like talk about that to the people who doesn't know. And uh, thanks to the. The, the the prohibition, which came right after the the industrial revolution, uh, we prohibited the cannabis without scientific base. It was just like political de decision. So there wasn't any science behind that. Uh, we was like booming the industry, so we didn't care about the environment at that time. It was just kind of like trying to make more efficient and more fast everything after especially after the the second world war so there was like understandable that we needed like fast progress so uh, we was like speeding the the industrial uh, revolution and or industrial like progress like industrial like production and we didn't care much about the environment but now we are really 
having just 12 years to really like figure out our future. If we don't do it now, we will be never really able to turn back uh, this like, let's say like bad, bad, bad direction of our like impact on, uh, on uh, environment. Okay. And uh, this plant, since we was using it, help also our society like stay sustainable because what what uh, when uh, and and since we prohibit it we we replace it uh, the the materials what we was used from hemp like the 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 fabrics hemp fabrics by cotton which is like you you heard uh, boas very unsustainable we we really like losing a lot of like water by using cotton. We uh, we replace the ropes by plastic. We replace the food by by like just industrial food with like low nutrition amounts. We uh, replace the the paper by wood, and so we the we we just like cutting the 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 forest to to turn it into paper which is not really sustainable at all because the forest we need for like produce the oxygen what we what we breathe yeah without like the forest we will hardly be able to to live in this planet okay we got to close up because we're right in the middle of coffee break since we got started okay late. okay I, I'm, I'm getting the point i'm okay. getting the point so uh, so the 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 topic it's very like uh, complex and uh, I believe that if we like really like keep in our minds like what really like these plants can can uh, help us to like uh, assist, like bring us the solutions for our issues nowadays. Uh, for me, it's the hope. For me, the the working on this like um, let's say like policy work, it's like my uh, like su survival plan. Yeah, if I don't work on that, I can hardly sleep because I don't I don't I don't really like see the another possible like future solution without without cannabis plant and uh, I hope like we will soon be able to understand that potential and like be smart enough to to legalize cannabis or regulate cannabis and and be able to bring it back on our fields and on our plates and in our like houses so thank you very much thank you Hanka and I have the privilege of introducing everyone to Steve Allen, who basically pioneered um, the use of hemp in building in Ireland. And um, he's the author of the book, Building with Hemp. I'm sure anybody who's in the hemp industry uh, probably has this book on their shelf. So let's just get right to it. He is uh, very entertaining and we, we won't fall asleep now that we've had our coffee and this great guest. Okay, hi everybody. Hope you can all uh, hurry up and take your seats. But uh, uh, I'm here to talk about how we really apply this hemp stuff to the United Nations Sustainability Goals. Now, who am I? I'm somebody that uh, fell into the influence of this plant about uh, 47 years ago. I uh, became a criminal three times within a few minutes. I was uh, in possession. And then I passed it to the person next to me, so I was guilty of supply. And because we were sitting in a circle, we were a drugs ring. <laughs> so it was a conspiracy. Anyway, it was a conspiracy to get high, and that getting high, I must admit, has helped me think. In a, I think, very positive way, it certainly feels positive to me. And uh, part of that uh, journey has been a long time, living a life trying to work out how you can live sustainably. And uh, uh, I have ended up teaching sustainability to a wide variety of different people, and uh, including ch children in primary schools, secondary school children, and adults, mainly adults. And uh, I've realized that we've, I've spent a lot of time identifying the problems so that people understand why we have to do something. That can be quite a depressing task. And as a father and a grandfather, you have to be super aware of the fact you're having on the younger generation. And so 
what I have experienced more and more, especially in the last five or six years of my 10 years of intensive sustainability teaching, is that people say, OK, we get it. Now, what can we do? So, it's about solutions, right? We've got to better offer solutions and neat packages to the UN about their sustainability goals. Because they're a bunch of people, as was said earlier by Michael, that are sort of needing our input. My God, they really need our input because they live their lives stuck in offices, wearing their suits, all looking very smart, and they've got no idea about what sustainability means. And many people don't. Sustainability means you can keep on doing things. And pretty much nothing we're doing on this planet right now is sustainable. So, okay, the UN has brought up these goals. And I'm not very a big fan of, of splitting sustainability issues into separate parts because it's part of a whole picture. And it's more like... You know, the sustainability gets taught in various different ways. One of them is to divide it into three different areas of environment, society, and economics. So, and they present this as like a Venn diagram of these three circles that vaguely overlap. Well, that's completely ridiculous because you cannot have an economy outside of society and you can't have a society outside of the environment. So, if you imagine it's more like Russian dolls and that Solutions and problems are inside each other. They're not externalized. It's all part of the same picture. So, taking that in mind, applying hemp to the sustainability goals. Now, I am approaching it primarily as somebody that uses it as a building material. But as anybody who understands or has studied architect or architecture or has or is, uh, works as an architect, you realize that the buildings that we build are an enormous impact on our lives. They come from the history of our evolution of society. We've evolved materials from our locality and built the most amazing structures. But increasingly, we're going against that. And that has an implication into the way we live in many other ways. So let's go back to the, the goals. And I'm going to number them off, all of them. I know we're supposed to focus on a few of them for this particular session, but I don't see how we can separate them out completely. And so I want to set the, the, the scene for this whole event the next two days with this. So no poverty. Right, well. I'll just put my glasses on so I don't miss out any of the points I've written down here. Greater production of cannabis will provide resources for farmers and make the valuable materials gained from production available to a larger number of people. This will reduce scarcity, scarcity of vital resources, which is part of the problem with poverty. Most wars are about resources. Right? So, number two, zero hunger. As the previous point the greater production of cannabis will produce more resources, one of which is the high-value foodstuffs, which both have high values of essential fatty acids and easily digestible proteins from the seed and potentially from the leaf material. Uh, the food is one of the products of this planet. It's very important. We can, we can live without clothing, we can live without shelter to a certain extent, but you can't live without food. So food is really important and it's one of the issues that when it comes to sustainability with issues like food miles that people seem to grasp, right? So, number three, good health and well-being. Access to cannabis medicines and high-value foods will improve health and well-being. Health implications also arise from the impact of successful agricultural activity on a community and the successive flows of materials into other manufacturing or processing incomes. The non-toxic environment provided by a hemp building protects health, the materials regulate humidity, and lock away VOCs in the surface of them. So health, the buildings we live in are very much important to our health, and a lot of people are suffering from sick building syndrome these days. And of course, we're all suffering from climate change because of the material production. So quality education is number four. In order to establish new or improved human activities, it is essential to increase the quality of education, to include the comprehension of the interconnected impacts of human activity, and how changes to how we create or produce the products we all consume are very much needed. So we need to really start educating to change the way we're thinking, right? Preparing our youth for the real future, not some imagined techno garbage, but like what's actually happening, right? So number five, gender equality. 
The roles and gender in society are always changing, and understanding how roles in society have evolved with technology is important. Women have been excluded from constructing homes in modern society due to the increased weight of components and the need for greater physical strength. But in many societies, women played a large part in erecting homes or community structures for thousands of years. Hemp materials being lighter and used in conjunction with other natural materials make them more approachable for everybody. It's a very tactile material. Number six, clean water and sanitation. So, cannabis production in traditional or organic farming systems improves the soil and therefore the environment and the water levels due to avoiding toxic levels of chemical inputs. Living in a hemp home will lessen the environment impacts during the building process and have design implications which educate inhabitants about lifestyle choices. So encouraging a move to compost toilets maybe or water recycling, all these sort of things are part of the awareness of what an eco house might be. Okay, so number seven is affordable and clean energy. Got three minutes. Now, the reduction of energy needs to have a great, is a greater likelihood of, of succeeding and making energy cheap as we reduce how much we're using. That's not usually factored into things. Right, understand? And uh, the recent concepts of utilizing carbonized hemp, which Carl's going to talk about, will definitely affect our energy use. Decent work and economic growth. Now, there's a phrase that I really have objection with, economic growth. We cannot have perpetual growth on a finite planet. So, that's a very important thing. We, you know, we, 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 we relate to G GDP and GMP, which is a really crazy way of analysing how our economies are actually being successful or not. And we should maybe choose the Bhutanese uh, principle of general gr uh, gross domestic happiness. So, number nine... Industry, innovation and infrastructure, three very broad subjects. Innovation is certainly needed in industry if alterations to the relevant infrastructure will have to happen to facilitate that. A move away from corporate entities to more community-connected production will help make industry sustainable. Adding value to materials produced by agriculture locally will reduce the need for populations to move to the cities. Number 10, reduced inequality is probably the hardest of all goals to implement. Sure, we all want things to be equal, but... Greed seems to get in the way, right? So how do we address that? I don't know, maybe uh, smoking a bit of weed might help, I don't know. But um, in number 11, sustainable cities and communities, cities cannot be sustainable without the connection to the surroundings, right? And, and, and a lot of cities and empires collapse because of that dislocation with their community. So you have to make them more sustainable by connecting them more. Uh, number 12, responsible consumption. Well, we have to like, legislate to stop the rubbish being produced in the first place so that we can't buy it. Number 13, climate action. Carbon is absorbed by the hemp plant as it grows, and carbon, uh, our hempcrete is classified as a carbon negative material because it absorbs more carbon than it emits and it helps in emissions later on. 14, well, number is what life below water. Keeping water clean is obviously very important, and hemp will definitely help doing that. Uh, we can make plastics and that sort of thing out of a, out of a, a bio, biodegradable compost, composites that uh, will reduce the need for a, a lot of problems with uh, 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 pollution in that way. So number 15 is life on land. We have heard how cannabis is benefit for, beneficial for farming, and I don't think I need to, to expand on that. Number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. What would you like for Christmas? Peace on earth. Yeah, that'd be great. So uh, that's where all the connections between sustainability come together because without all those things being addressed, we're never going to have peace. And then partnerships and goals, we all need to work together. And the cannabis field, excuse the pun, is no exception. Massive investment of time, energy and money is needed to achieve these goals we've outlined. And if the focus of investors is drawn to the supposed quick profits of a medical extract industry, we will ignore the other more basic vital resources we need to create. The global implications of how we feed or house ourselves are greater than providing a bandage for the train wreck that humanity is approaching. Thank you for that. Um, Hempcrete is one of my favorite um, look-aheads as we uh, 
you know, I, I guess if I had to offer what I thought was a good idea is that we would see um, indoor cultivation um, being built first from hempcrete buildings. So it helps to control humidity. Um, it, it's definitely more energy efficient for, for your purposes. And it shows good use of the same plant that we're producing indoors. So let's look at that as we start build, uh, creating our build-out profiles for our manufacturing facilities, for our cultivation facilities. Let's really think about looping back to this plant's industrial base um, i just like to offer that out there. I'm proud to introduce also Mr. Carl Martell, who is going to talk about my next favorite subject where cannabis sativa is, is the energy potential um, opportunities in that. And he has created a novel device at this moment. It's novel and hopefully will lead us into the future um, of a carbon hemp battery unit. And he'll, I'm sure, tell us more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so cannabis, we're talking about cannabis today. In Canada for a long time, and I think everybody here, when you say word cannabis, what comes to mind? Marijuana, pot, you know, something we smoke, right? Or get high on or everything else. What cannabis really is though, it's, it's more than just that. It's everything else, literally everything else, okay? I'm gonna put it, put it to this way too. It's just the way that our mindset has been kind of led to this kind of distinction between industrial hemp, which is the last time I'm gonna use that term, okay, and, and, and cannabis, there's that distinction. It shouldn't be there. I'm gonna tell you what. When you go to the supermarket, okay, and you walk into the supermarket and you look at a potato, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Vodka? Certainly not for me. How about rye? Whiskey? No. Rice? Sake? No. 95% of all industrial cannabis okay, grown in Canada, okay, is for grain production. It's food, right, 95%. Now, we just recently legalized uh, recreational cannabis, okay, and we have legalized medicinal cannabis about 20 years ago, at the same time as we did industrial hemp, right? Industrial hemp and industrial cannabis is the same thing, and I would encourage everybody to start adopting, okay, this terminology, right? Do away with all the other words and everything else because Hemp, cannabis, all the same thing, okay? So what I do, where I work from, is I work in industrial cannabis, and I have been for about the last 10 years. And I work with mainly the, the waste streams that are generated, okay, by this plant, okay? So in the food side, you know, they're dehulling, they create all kinds of waste streams from that. Uh, the fiber that's left in the field, we can use, decorticate, create fibers, all those other things. Now, from that as well, I've gone on and developed many different products from hemp that wouldn't traditionally be thought of, right, with that product. So cannabis can actually do everything. So in the top left corner, you're gonna see something I call a geopolymer. It's a geohemp. It's a combination, it's a composite between minerals and, um, and cannabis. It's essentially a type of uh, hempcrete, right? So next, cannabis plastic. So that is 100% pure. So that light switch plate you see right there is 100% pure hemp. There's no other additives into that, okay? So it's, it's hemp. It's just the way that we're functionalizing cellulose in particular ways that can actually then bond together to create this type of plastic. There's no other plastic in that. It's not a composite. That's pure hemp, okay? Cottonized. Cottonized cannabis, right? Same thing that we'll be using for your clothes, your uh, cotton balls, uh, women hygiene products, uh, you name it. Uh, Delignification processes for that and to recover basically the cellulose. Bottom right, left hand corner, you'll see a fence. That's actually made with hemp paint or cannabis paint. And this is actually a derivative of the food industry. <coughs> so food creates this hemp oil, okay? Hemp seed oil, right? It's not the same as the, the CBD oils or anything else. This is hemp seed. Just press the seed and you get an oil. That goes to the food industry. What I've done is I've taken the expired food grade hemp oil and then changed it a bit and created paint. That's 100% pure, right? You can stick your finger in that paint, put it in your mouth, and it's just that. The colors are natural. It's dirt, right? Beside that is a carbon foam. This is one of the things that I think will eventually, um, could potentially replace a lot of different things. It is made from carbon. Okay, and it's, it's, it's an insulation material like hempcrete or like styrofoam, except this, 
right? It doesn't burn, and it's non-toxic. You can use it, spread it on the farmer's field after, it's, after you're done, and it has some very good insulative properties. Next beside that is an absorbent, right? So oil spills, that will float on water. It'll absorb the, the oil spill water, or for soil remediation, these sort of things. I can take that back to the lab and then recover both the cannabis and the oil. Beside that is a uh, paper electrode. Again, 100% pure cannabis. It's just cannabis. So the cellulose derived from the plant combined with the uh, biochar that would essentially be made, combined together, create a conductive type of paper material. So right. I'll move on that. I'm not done, I'm not done yet. I know, but, I'm, not done. But I'm just so excited about all these products, I can't help myself. So. You won't be able to read actually some of this, but um, up on top here. So everybody knows about CBD, what they, and, and you know for medicinal purposes. What they might not know is that if it's, um, I would say synthesized in a, okay, how do I explain this in a way that be, okay, so in an acid environment, okay, so your, your CBD will convert and then change over to CBDA, or from CBDA to CBD, THC, and so on. In an alkaline environment, it does something different. Okay, so we can synthesize, actually, what I've done is called, it's CBDH, CBDHQ, okay, it's a hydroxyquinones. Now, quinones are what plants use, okay, to basically help conduct electricity within the plant, okay. On my business card, I actually have a statement right underneath, first understand nature, then copy it. So that's what I've been trying to do. Now, quinones, when you take and you combine and you create these kind of what do you call a, a flow cell battery. So it's two giant tanks of this liquid, okay, of CBD, essentially, okay? And you use carbon that you derive from the plant. Now, universities in the United States, whether it be Texas, uh, Harvard, a few others, have been experimenting with these flow cells and using quinones, some from rhubarb and other things. We can actually get those as well from cannabis, right? So in the future, okay, when we combine quinones with graphene, Okay, graphene can actually be derived from cannabis, okay, to create a sustainable type of battery. We can grow our batteries, literally, from the ground instead of mining them. I'm gonna go up one more. Three minutes. How many? Three minutes. Right here. Oh. Okay, so in the top picture, it's what I call a BIES. Okay, so it's building integrated energy storage. That is essentially hempcrete, okay? But that hempcrete brick that you see right there is charging that tablet. Now, one of the things that I want to, I put a wall underneath there to make a, a visualization for you, okay? So that one brick is about five volts, five amps. Now, if you look at a building outside, start counting all those bricks on the side of that wall. How many volts, how many amps could you store on the outside of that building? I, I stopped counting after about 10, but go ahead, you know. It just keeps going and going and going. That's one of the important things about future batteries, right, is the importance of surface area, okay? Look at all the surface areas that we have that we don't use and we can be using in our cities, right? The outside of buildings actually store that energy from solar panels that would say it'd be on your roof. You store it in the walls on the outside of your building and then you can draw upon that. No more power lines needed, no more nothing, right? Highways can actually be built doing this sort of thing, okay? So how did I come to that? I got two minutes left. Yeah. I don't know if I'll be able to get to it all. Let's see if I get one more here. That picture didn't show up. So, how I came to all that though, right? It was in experimenting with the cannabis plant, right? Over time, I was working with hempcretes and developing things and discovered one day that, oh, this, can, this material is conductive when I combine it with these different minerals. And then lo and behold, that led to this kind of a idea of a BIES, which is somewhat similar to what you have out there today is called a BIPV, which is a building integrated photovoltaics where you're wrapping your buildings actually in solar panels. So I envision one day that we'd be able to wrap our buildings in solar panels, right? And then those panels would charge the wall directly behind it. And then you draw your energy right from that building. So I see a very green future for this planet if we follow you know, some of these principles that we're actually laying down. It's unfortunate the UN wasn't here today because I'm sure they don't know about this, you know, and uh, it'd be nice to, for them to actually hear some of these things. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah.
So I'll give you the bad news first. The bad news is we are not opening the floor up right now to a question and answer period, and I apologize for that. The good news is we're here all day and tomorrow all day as well. So please um, feel free to approach all of our speakers today. You can find their information also in the program. And I think I'll let you guys finish. There's microphones um, around you. And if you have maybe just one last closing quick thought, <laughs> please. And we'll start on the outside with Tony. Okay. I threw you on the spot, didn't threw I? I'm so sorry. <laughs> threw me on the spot. Well, I started off with all this bad news. And as we've heard so far from all the speakers after me, there are a lot of promising possibilities. So... Um, I w would love to talk with each of you more later on, on those possibilities. So I think I'll leave it with that. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, um, I just think we need to, 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 to get, try and get all our thoughts recorded in some way uh, so that we can really formulate the real great strong response to the United Nations because this is what it's about. We need to make them listen some way or another. So making our... Our, our ideas consolidate and be distilled a little, maybe. Uh, a concluding thought. Uh, Turn on your mic. Oh. Okay. Got it. Um, I just conclude by reiterating that uh, this is a really unique opportunity, a really unique moment in time to craft uh, cannabis agriculture uh, into the industry that we want it to be. Uh, I think we often lament the state of our food systems uh, around the world, and it's often hard to change them because of the entrenched interests that are uh, already uh, very happy with the status quo. And here we have an interesting situation in which an industry is entering the legal marketplace for the first time, and we have a relatively blank slate in order to, in order to craft the type of regulations that create uh, the type of industry that we want to see. Right on. I agree. <clears throat> uh, the evil of all evils here is the uh, prohibition that is uh, governed by uh, United Nations conventions, and that uh, prevents uh, the, from all of us uh, freeing this uh, marvelous plant uh, for its many uses and to uh, integrate uh, uh, hemp and cannabis, or cannabis, uh, the uh, cannabis sativa, into the vision of sustainable uh, future. So uh, the, uh, the key here in this conference was to make the connection, the linkage, between the abolition of prohibition and the uh, potential for hemp uh, to sustain uh, our uh, existence for the future generations. And that's very important. It is. It's why we're here, because we can do it. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to mention, because like now it's like the big topic, uh, like for the regulation, the standards and standardization of our processes, kind of like professionalization of the hemp industry or cannabis industry. And I would like to really see that all these standards will be just done for like sustainability. Yeah? Like why we should like as a hemp industry, which works with such a great sustainable plant, not have a standards based on organic growing and sustainable processes. So I think this, if we can as a like, cannabis people or hemp people or hemp industry agreed on uh, the standards which will exclude all the non-organic growing or the like plastic packaging or the kind of like just like have kind of like high standards of sustainability we can become really the leaders of the of the of the sustainability movement overnight, yeah? And believe me, we will achieve a lot of support from environmental organization and all the people who are fighting the climate change and we will be able to become not so isolated because of this drug issue, but we will be able to break, create the bridge for like better future and like became the family of like this like big group of the family of these environmentalists. So I hope we will be able to open some talks during this conference to talk about how hemp industry can be leader of the sustainable development or because they don't have how to achieve that and we have the tool for sustainable development so it will be good to, to bring it on the table and agree as a hemp industry that we really want that and 
Hopefully we can have some discussions about that. Sustainability is a marketing tool too. So you want to make sure that you consider that as you move your businesses forward. Being a sustainable company and, and highlighting your sustainability brings clients to you because more people and more are beginning to understand sustainability. Last thoughts? You? Thank you. Um, 150 years ago, Cannabis was the most widely traded agricultural crop in the world. More than corn, more than anything else. I believe that one day, and soon, it will again be that crop. 